I'd like to start by apologizing for starting this part on a dark and depressing note. It'll definitely pick up from here, but at this point in our story, it is inevitable to discuss about this moment. By the 1960s, Walt Disney's dreams and ambitions have grown to become far bigger than anyone could ever imagine, especially when he kept on accomplishing major achievements at the time, like participating in the 1964 New York World's Fair and produce one of his most acclaimed feature films, Mary Poppins. In animation, not only did he and his team revolutionize how they made their animated films with the Xerox process, but he also got more personally involved with the production of The Jungle Book, like he used to from Snow White to Bambi. While there may have been a lot of tough moments during production, for the first time in many years, Walt's old spark for animation was finally back, and it looked like the future of Disney's animated films would be brighter than ever with the old master's personal touch. That would have been the case if it wasn't for one unexpected event on December 15th, 1966, a moment that is regarded as the darkest day in the company's history. Walt Disney, the man who made his dreams come true with a mouse, passed away. He died of a circulatory collapse due to lung cancer from nearly a lifetime of heavy smoking. While rumors still circulate to this day that he was cryogenically frozen so that he could be unfreeze once a cure for his illness is found, the truth is actually the opposite. Two days after his passing, he was cremated and his ashes reside in the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. When The Jungle Book was released 10 months later, some have accredited its critical and financial success to the public's response of the loss of Walt, as it was the first animated film released after his death. At the studio, everyone who knew him was devastated of the news. But after some time of mourning, they knew the right thing to do for Walt afterwards was to finish what he left off. He had several passion projects that he unfortunately would never see in their completion. But under the new leadership of his brother Roy, everyone in the company was dedicated to bring Walt's final projects in development to life. Other than The Jungle Book, there was the last live-action feature he was personally involved with, The Happiest Millionaire. The rides of New Orleans Square at Disneyland that became the two most iconic attractions of the Disney parks, Pirates of the Caribbean, and The Haunted Mansion. A ski resort in Mineral King that never came to be. But the proposed audio animatronic show continued forward to the parks, where it became another popular Disney attraction, Country Bear Jamboree. But his most ambitious and biggest project he left off was a large area in Orlando, Florida that would have featured resorts, a more elaborate version of Disneyland, and an experimental prototype community of tomorrow. When Walt was developing it, he dubbed it Project X, but then later gave it an official name, Disney World. After Roy stepped in to make the project the company's top priority, the complex that included a theme park called the Magic Kingdom, along with two resorts nearby, opened on October 1st, 1971, where the name Disney World was changed in honor of Roy's little brother to Walt Disney World. A few months later, Roy was gone too. Back at the animation studio, times were tough especially when the absence of their leader was heartbreakingly noticeable. But like everyone else at the company, they were determined to finish off whatever was left of Walt's unfinished projects, including the final animated feature that Disney personally approved, The Aristocats. It's the story of a cat named Duchess, along with her kittens, Toulouse, Marie, and Berlioz, who are next in line to receive the fortune of their owner, Madame Madeleine Bonfamille, by the time she passes away. Her butler, Edgar, is furious that the cats get a higher priority than him in her will and tries to get them out of the picture by abandoning them in the countryside. Meanwhile, an alley cat named Thomas O'Malley finds the missing cats, which he then gives them a tour around Paris and introduce them to his musical friends. But once Edgar returned to finish the job, it's up to Thomas and many other animals to stop the butler before the cats get shipped to Timbuktu. For many years, people know about the journey of how Duchess and her kids escaped the wrath of the butler, but what few people actually know is the journey of how the feature came to be, because the original plans were never to make this either a movie, nor even animated. It all started back in 1961, 
when Walt Disney was looking for animal stories for his wonderful World of Color TV show. The two guys for the job to find that story were directors Tom McGowan and producer Harry Title, where they searched for ideas and then found this one book about a mother cat and her kittens in New York City. It may not sound like much, but it is a good start of something. So after some modifications and developing a whole draft, the two created their animal story that can be served as both a two-parter TV special and a whole feature film to release in theaters by putting the two parts together. The original story was about a butler and a maid, possibly played by Boris Karloff and Françoise Rosé, who continuously failed to kill the cats of their mistress, since the animals were in front of them in line to inherit her fortune. At the same time, the story also goes into the perspective of the cats, where they get to talk whenever humans are not around, and the setting would be in Paris, France, in the veins of how the London location worked out for 101 Dalmatians. The first draft was written by Tom Rowe, an American writer and painter living in Paris, and when Wolpe received the script through title, he liked it. Somewhat. He did made a few cuts and adjustments that did upset Rowe, but it wasn't like he could do anything about it. But then, after years of rewrites in the summer of 1963, the project went into a completely different direction. When discussing with Walt, Harry suggested the potential idea of having the movie be fully animated instead of live action, since this could open up more gag possibilities and bring back old elements that were originally cut like having musical cats. Disney was intrigued of the proposition, especially when the script did get the approval of Wooly Ritherman, Ken Anderson, the animators, and others close to him. And so, Walt agreed to have it be an animated film, but also had to put it on hold to make more room for developing the Jungle Book. But when there was time to work on the feature, he knew the right people for the job, and some of them were already in the studio for the Jungle Book. Once again, Disney hired Phil Harris to improvise and be the voice of Thomas O'Malley, and the Sherman Brothers returned to write the songs. But then, after the time Walt passed away, that's when production started to get... complicated. The team put their focus more on Aristocats once they were finished with The Jungle Book, but making a movie without Disney was first proven to be quite difficult. Even more changes and cuts had to be made to the story. Elvira the Maid, considered to be voiced by Elsa Lanchester, was taken out so that the butler is on his own. They added other animals like geese and a mouse named Rockford, voiced by Sterling Holloway, and the songs by the Sherman Brothers were all taken out, except for scales and arpeggios, in favor of several others. At that point, the Shermans were having a hard time dealing with the new management after Walt's death, and after their work on bed knobs and broomsticks, the two quit the studio. They wouldn't return until about 30 years later to compose the songs for the 2000 Winnie the Pooh film, The Tigger Movie. And what's worse, Tom Rowe came back trying to sue Disney in order to get the rights to the characters. Originally, legendary jazz musician Louis Armstrong was supposed to voice Scat Cat, but because he got ill and backed out, the team acted quickly to get a replacement and ended up with Scatman Crothers to be the new voice. When the cats came out of the bag on Christmas Eve 1970, the film received some positive results. There have been better, but no one said that it was bad. The critics praised it for its animation, voice acting, and charm, but they were aware that it didn't have that bold strength as the other Disney films. As for the box office, it managed to perform very well, earning $11 million domestically and a worldwide total of $28 million. Following the re-releases years later, its total substantially grew to $191 million. While the Aristocats gathered a prominent following, especially Marie being a bit of a merchandise queen herself, there were a couple of attempts to grow the film into a franchise. In 2000, Disney was developing an animated series starring the kittens as teenagers in the modern age, and a direct-to-video sequel was planned in 2005 that would star Marie and could have potentially been in computer animation. However, when the animation division was under new management in 2006, those plans ended up getting shipped off to Timbuktu. Throughout the 1960s, the movie spent a lot of time finding its true identity, and just when things started to look clear on what to do, Walt's passing created several obstacles for the movie. But in the end, it managed to come out on top, and still made Disney the cool cats of the big screen. 
And because Disney knows that the cat's the only cat who knows where it's at, even without Walt, the movie still made everybody wanting to be a cat. While the cats did give the animation team the motivational boost they needed to move forward without Walt, their next feature would accomplish something that the studio tried to do for decades. They had films starring cats, dogs, deer, and even an elephant, but now they could finally make their feature starring a fox with Robin Hood. In the town of Nottingham, there is a vigilante named Robin Hood, along with his friend Little John, who steals from the greedy King of England, Prince John, and gives the money to the townsfolk. But while he goes out of his way to help the poor and takes some time to be with his love, Maid Marian, he teams up with the Nottingham people to seek justice against the corruption of Prince John and take back what is theirs. Ever since the release of Snow White, Walt and his team tried numerous efforts of developing an animated feature that would star a fox. More specifically though, Reynard the Fox from the 12th century folklore. While there were possibilities to develop a strong story, what held back Walt were the concerns if it would be considered too sophisticated for kids, and if the main character himself can even be viewed as a legitimate hero especially when he's depicted as an animal that's often antagonized in cartoons. Even Disney himself is guilty of doing this on a few occasions, portraying them as either a con artist like Honest John and Pinocchio, or a hungry predator like Br'er Fox in Song of the South. He tried again when developing Treasure Island, where it was originally a Song of the South style film where, on several occasions, Long John Silver would tell the stories of Reynard to Jim Hawkins through animated segments to teach him lessons. However, those plans ended up getting scrapped in favor of having it be Disney's first fully live action feature. The only other time Disney and the animators tried to push the character into one of their films was to make him a villain like many of their other animated foxes and have him be against the protagonist of their proposed Chanticleer movie. But as I've mentioned before, it lost the fight for Walt's pick when it was up against the Sword in the Stone. Fast forwarding to 1970, close to the completion of the Aristocats, Ken Anderson was pitching ideas to the executives, and one of them was an adaptation of Robin Hood, but with a little twist. The cast would be anthropomorphic animals, with the lead being a fox like Reynard, but one who uses his cunning skills for good, and the setting would be in the Deep South, in the similar veins of Song of the South. While the executives really liked the idea, they were a little iffy regarding the Deep South theming especially when comparing it to the controversial Song of the South. But after they agreed to keep the setting more true to the English folklore, like the company previously did with their 1952 film, The Story of Robin Hood and His Merry Men, the project was greenlit and the writers, including Larry Clemens, began work on the script and storyboards. For the voice of Robin Hood, Disney originally thought of having Tommy Steele, inspired by his performance in The Happiest Millionaire, but since he didn't sound heroic enough for the part, they decided to give the role to Brian Bedford after testing him out. As the animators were on work to develop the movie, they were often faced with several limitations, either because of the schedule, the budget, or the creative clash between Ken Anderson and the director and producer Wolfgang Reitherman. One example for the latter is that Anderson wanted Robin's entire team of merry men to be featured in the movie. But since Reitherman wanted this to be more like a buddy picture in the style of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the Merry Men were just reduced to just Little John, once again played by Phil Harris for his third Disney film in a row. While most of them were removed, some did manage to stay in the film, but have their roles switched like Alan Adale as the narrator and Friar Tuck as one of the townsfolk of Nottingham. As they were spending so much time finding the right actors and creating the world of the picture, they ended up falling behind schedule. In an effort to speed production and save money to keep the budget as low as they can, the animators resorted to recycling animation from their older films. While this was not the first nor the last time Disney reused their own animations for the ones they would work on, this movie is the most prominent example of this technique especially the phony King of England scene where it recycles dance sequences from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, The Jungle Book, and even their previous feature, The Aristocats. When it was released on November 8, 1973, like last time, the critics enjoyed the feature, but up to a certain extent. 
They liked the strong cast, the great animation, and the charming humor, but it wasn't necessarily a big hit for everyone. But one thing Robin Hood knows what to do best is get the money, and he grabbed himself a lot of riches at the box office with $9.6 million domestically and a worldwide total of $27.5 million, which the additional re-release bumped it up a bit to about $35 million. Robin was even close to stealing himself an Oscar, as the song Love was nominated for Best Original Song. Speaking of that song, Love was played again many years later in another animated film starring a fox and a cast of anthropomorphic animals, the 2009 Wes Anderson stop-motion film Fantastic Mr. Fox. Woohoo! Woo! Whoa! Look at that! This kid's a natural! I'm speechless, Christopherson! Another song from the movie that found popularity from an unexpected source was Whistle Stop, as speeding it up would turn it into one of the first internet viral sensations, the hamster dance. However, if there was one person who was the most upset about Disney's version of Robin Hood, it would probably be Louis Prima. Well, it wasn't that he hated the movie, he was just mad that he didn't get to play a part in the film. As a response, a year after the film's release, Prima made an entire album dedicated to the movie called Let's Hear It for Robin Hood, which he managed to sell it to Disney. Ever since it was released, some have grown to be more critical towards the picture, and even considered it as one of Disney's weakest films. But at the same time, the film also gathered a prominent cult following, where many have even admitted that the fox himself has stolen their hearts. Just like a true vigilante, you can either love him or hate him, but his intentions are undeniably true to do good for those that need him the most. Moving forward to a little over three years, their next animated feature would be more unique than their previous films. While it does technically count as a feature-length movie, it's more like a collection of shorts bundled together as one big film. But unlike Fantasia and the package films of the 1940s, these cartoons were already made and previously released individually, even going back to when Walt was alive. And that was The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, based on the classic children's books by A. A. Milne. As I've just said, the movie consists of three animated shorts inspired by the stories from the first two Pooh books, Winnie the Pooh and The House at Pooh Corner, set in the imaginary world of a young boy named Christopher Robin called The Hundred Acre Woods, inhabited by Christopher's childhood toys and animals from his backyard. The first cartoon of the movie is Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, where Pooh's appetite for honey often gets him into sticky situations, no pun intended, like avoiding bees that are guarding their honey and getting stuck in Rabbit's door. When it came to the Disney family, they had always been big fans of the A.A. A. Milne books, even going as far back as the 1930s, Wolf first discovered them when his daughters were reading and giggling at them out loud. Ever since 1938, Walt was always interested in getting the film rights to Pooh, but would never fully achieve it until 1961. He also went and grabbed the American and Canadian merchandising rights that included Pooh's signature red shirt. Three years later, Walt was planning with his animation team on developing a Winnie the Pooh movie. But after several discussions, they decided that it would be best to turn the books into a set of cartoons as a way to gradually introduce American audiences to the silly old bear. Some of the changes made from the books to have it be more Americanized include updating the current characters, adding more humor onto the story, and include a new character that Americans could relate to with Gopher. However, at the same time, Walt also wanted his team to be more respectful to the source material just so the same mistakes from Alice in Wonderland wouldn't happen again. For the voices, they enlisted many veteran Disney voice actors to perform in the short, or at least those who had previous experience voicing in Disney films. Sterling Holloway played the role of Pooh, as I've said before, 
But then there was also Sebastian Cabot, the voice of Sir Ector in The Sword of the Stone and Bagheera in The Jungle Book as the narrator for his final film role. Barbara Luddy, the voice of Lady in Lady and the Tramp and Merryweather in Sleeping Beauty as Kanga. And Julius Matthews, the voice of Archimedes in The Sword and the Stone as Rabbit. While Wolfgang Ratherman was hired to direct the feature, the animation job went on to the people who were not busy with working on The Jungle Book, like Eric Larson and John Lounsbury. Disney also brought in the Sherman Brothers to write the songs for the short, but they had a bit of a hard time to find some inspiration for Pooh, even when reading the original books. It wouldn't be until they had a chat with British set and costume designer Tony Walton, who was a big Winnie the Pooh fan, that gave the boys all the inspiration they needed, along with a newfound love for the bear, to write songs that include Up, Down and Touch the Ground, Rumbly in My Tumbly, Little Black Rain Cloud, Mind Over Matter, and of course, Winnie the Pooh. The short was first released on February 4th, 1966, along with the movie The Ugly Dachshund. Despite being more careful not to fall in the same trap as Alice, it ended up happening anyways with the critical response. British critics despised the new take with the way it tarnished the beloved characters with the Disney brand. However, when it came to American audiences and critics, they loved the short and were immediately charmed to Disney's interpretation. So much so that in the summer of 1967, right when the studio was finishing up The Jungle Book and The Aristocats was well into production, the animation team decided to create a sequel short as their first animated project after Walt Disney's death, and the last to have him credited as a producer. In this one, titled Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, a storm threatens the Hundred Acre Woods and the gang must do whatever they can in order to save their little friend Piglet. Since the animators were free from their Jungle Book duties, even more of the nine old men helped out with the animation of the short, including Milt Call, Frank Thomas, and Ollie Johnston. In an attempt to learn from their past mistakes and to win over the British critics, the goal of the short is to stay more true to the source material than they were with the Honey Tree. This included bringing on board characters from the book that were not featured in the first short like Tigger, Piglet, and Pooh's nightmare of Heffalumps and Woozles. Funny enough, despite not appearing in the first cartoon, Tigger and Piglet were featured in the poster, but their design stuck closer to the original style of the books than how they ended up in the shorts. Originally, when plans began to adapt Winnie the Pooh, Walt wanted to have actor and Disneyland performer Wally Bogue to be the voice of Tigger. But after Walt passed, the studio felt like his performance was too zany, even for Tigger, and the role ended up going to Paul Winchell. When the short was released on December 20th, 1968, alongside the horse in the gray flannel suit, the result and reception turned out to be much better. So much so that it even won an Oscar for Best Animated Short, which also makes it Walt's last Academy Award. By the way, you know Walt Disney is the person who won the most Oscars in history when not even death can stop him from receiving another one. As this one also features more beloved songs by the Sherman Brothers, one of them, Heffalumps and Woozles, would often stand out for audiences for its psychedelically eerie nature in the style of Pink Elephants on Parade from Dumbo. This is why the song would often be a staple during Disney's Halloween parties at the parks. Years later, another Pooh short was made called Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, where the story focuses more on Tigger. While Rabbit is sick and tired of him unexpectedly bouncing and pouncing on everyone and failed to get him lost in the forest, it did happen when his bouncing got him in trouble on top of a tall tree while having a fear of heights that's stopping him from getting down. For this one, Wolfgang Ratherman stepped down as the director to give the position to John Lounsbury, but Wooly was still involved as a producer. At this point, it's a good time to mention that the voice of Christopher Robin always changed for every short. In The Honey Tree, he was played by the voice of Mowgli, Bruce Reitherman. In The Blustery Day, it was John Walmsley. And for Tigger 2, Timothy Turner took the part. The latter short also replaced the voice of Rue, who was previously done by the actor of Hottie Jr. in The Jungle Book, Clint Howard, with Dory Whitaker. The short came out exactly six years after its predecessor on December 20th, 1974 with The Island at the Top of the World, 
and while it did not achieve the same level of success as before, it still did do very well. The cartoon received an Oscar nomination for Best Animated Short, which the winner at the time was Will Vinton's Closed Mondays. However, it did manage to win a Grammy Award for Best Album for Children. By combining all three shorts, each with an estimated running time of 25 minutes each, along with animating new scenes to stitch them all together, they resulted in Pooh's first animated feature, released on March 11, 1977. And since Pooh already made his mark in pop culture after over a decade and got an Oscar, it is safe to say that the film was very well received. Ever since the movie's release, from the 1980s onward, not only would Pooh and his friends at the Hundred Acre Woods become very prominent members of the Disney family, but the whole franchise became a multi-billion dollar juggernaut. In 1983, not only did Disney create a fourth animated short called Winnie the Pooh and a Day for Eeyore, but they also released their first Winnie the Pooh TV series called Welcome to Pooh Corner, a live action show with animatronic costumes that ran for 120 episodes in three years. After that, another series appeared, this time animated, named The New Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. The show premiered in 1988 and ran for four seasons and 50 episodes. But what makes this one stand out is the massive praise it received, where critics even went as far as call it the best animated series of its time, along with winning two Daytime Emmys and two Humanitas Prizes. During the 2000s, two more shows were made geared towards preschoolers that aired on Playhouse Disney, now called Disney Junior. There was The Book of Pooh, a puppet show that premiered in 2001 that ran for two seasons and 51 episodes, and My Friends Tigger and Pooh, a computer animated series that featured a new human character named Darby and her puppy Buster that started in 2007 and had three seasons with 63 episodes. While Pooh kept inviting TV viewers to the Hundred Acre Woods with his shows and specials, between 1997 and 2010, the franchise released a total of nine direct-to-video features. The first, Pooh's Grand Adventure, The Search for Christopher Robin, is more like a sequel to many adventures, while the rest act more like spin-offs of either the TV shows or previous Pooh works. But if a whole collection of direct-to-video films wasn't enough, Christopher Robin's toys had gotten so big that some of these movies meant for direct-to-video ended up getting a theatrical release, including the Tigger movie in 2000, Piglet's Big Movie in 2003, and Pooh's Heffalump movie in 2005. While they may not have been the strongest source of revenue for Pooh, they did receive some positive reception from the critics who stated that they each still hold on to the charm and wholesomeness of the franchise. At the parks, while Pooh and his friends have been popular meet and greet characters since Walt was alive, he wouldn't officially receive his own attraction until 1999 named after the first movie which featured iconic scenes from the film that can be found in all the parks with the exception of Paris and Tokyo. The latter instead has its own trackless dark ride named Pooh's Honey Hunt that opened in 2000 and has since become the most popular ride in Fantasyland in Tokyo's Magic Kingdom. But bigger than any of that, more than the TV shows, movies, and rides, the real gold mine of Winnie the Pooh came from the merchandise. Clothes, toys, video games, books, accessories, you name it, it'll have some pieces of Pooh in there. At its peak, Winnie the Pooh was ranked as one of the highest selling franchises of all time and estimated a worth for Disney of up to $6 billion. There is more to tell about the Pooh phenomenon when going into the 2010 decade, but that will be another chapter for another day. For now, let's close the book, knowing that the little bear will always be waiting. After the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, the public didn't have to wait too long for Disney's next animated feature. In fact, their following movie came out just three months after Pooh, and that was The Rescuers, based on the children's novel series by Marjorie Sharp. It's about two mice who are a part of the Rescue 8 Society, an organization of mice from around the world that pledge to help others in need. One is the Hungarian representative named Miss Bianca, and the other is the timid janitor named Bernard. 
Bianca accepted a mission and have Bernard to be her co-agent to rescue an orphan girl named Penny who is kidnapped by Madame Medusa and Mr. Snoops, who intend to use her to retrieve the world's biggest diamond called the Devil's Eye in a pirate cave. With the help of some friendly animals, Bianca and Bernard must accomplish their mission to save Penny and get her out of harm's way. The idea of a rescuers movie began back in 1962, when the team developed a story that resembled more like the first book. In the original plans, Miss Bianca and Bernard were meant to rescue a poet that was held captive by a ruthless totalitarian government. However, Walt Disney scrapped the project as the political tones were too much for the kind of movies he usually produced. Fast forwarding to 1970, Miss Bianca would have a second chance at Disney with a team led by one of the rising stars at the studio, Don Bluth. Their plan for the movie would be to adapt the most recent novel of the series at the time called Miss Bianca in the Antarctic, where the mice had to rescue a polar bear who was forced to perform in shows against his will. The film would have been more of a musical, as the polar bear named Louis the Bear, played by Louis Prima, would sing six songs written by Floyd Huddleston. Over time, Louis's design and location would change. But after Prima was diagnosed with a stem brain tumor, by 1975, the plans for the bear had to be let go. Meanwhile, when Robin Hood was complete, Ken Anderson suggested a plan to adapt the Paul Gallico book, Scruffy, about a group of monkeys from Gibraltar who were threatened to be captured by Nazis from the British Empire in World War II. But that project ended up thrown out by the studio in favor of continuing rescuers, thus having the veterans come into the production. The first thing they did when they came in was to scrap the entire Arctic aesthetic and replace it with potential ideas for the villain, which they considered to bring back Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians, now updated so her fashion sense was all about alligators. However, since the animation crew wasn't comfortable yet with the idea of making sequels, Cruella was ditched and they decided to find their villainous source in the book Miss Bianca. The result was a loose adaptation of the bad guys from the book, including Mandrake becoming Mr. Snoops, which the animators modeled after animation historian John Culhane, the Bloodhounds Tyrant and Torment became the Alligators Brutus and Nero, and the main antagonist, Diamond Duchess, turned into Madame Medusa. The villain was the last Disney character to be animated by Milk Call, and he wanted to have her be his grand finale in Disney animation, his magnum opus of his career. So much so that he nearly ended up animating Medusa all by himself. However, the villains weren't the only ones that went through some changes before becoming the characters we know them in the final picture. Bianca and Bernard were originally considered to be a married couple, but then decided that not having them married was a more romantic option, as it opens the door to see love bloom along their adventure. Also, Orville was meant to be a pigeon, but Ollie Johnston suggested to make him an albatross, as he remembered in one of Walt's true life adventures of the clumsy ways they take off and land that can have plenty of comedic potential. On a side note, this was one of the very rare moments where Orville's voice actor, Jim Jordan, came out of retirement after the passing of his wife Marion in 1961. This movie is also noted to be Jordan's final film role. And finally, for the other supporting characters at the Bayou, they were meant to be serious home guards that were always marching. But by time, the characters grew into a bunch of volunteers who helped Bianca and Bernard along the way while the Dragonfly-powered Swampmobile grew into its own character named Evanrude, which Jimmy McDonald came back from retirement to do his sound effects. The Bayou creatures also had a bullfrog as their leader that was meant to be voiced by Phil Harris, but was eventually removed. Besides, Phil was already in enough Disney films virtually playing the same character anyway, so it wasn't a big loss. When the movie was released on June 22, 1977, the reviews were positively mixed for the mice of the Rescue 8 Society. And by positively mixed, I mean that the critics' reception ranged from calling it a decent feature to praising it as one of Disney's best films since Mary Poppins. Even Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson stated that it was the best movie they made without Walt Disney. At the box office, it was Disney's most successful animated feature of its time 
earning a worldwide total of $48 million, and its success continued with the re-releases to have its total grow into $169 million. On top of receiving an Oscar nomination for the song Someone's Waiting For You, on its first re-release in 1983, the movie was accompanied with the 26-minute short Mickey's Christmas Carol, which made it the first time in over 30 years since 1953's The Simple Things that Mickey made an appearance on the big screen. While Bianca and Bernard's mission was quite successful without any trouble during its theatrical runs, it wasn't until when its VHS came out in 1999 when controversy came out of nowhere. In the scene where Orville dives down after takeoff with the mice, there were a couple of shots that were discovered that featured a picture of a real topless woman, showing off her breasts, nipples, and all. Nobody knew why or who snuck in that picture onto the film, but ever since that discovery, Disney edited it out for all following releases. But even with that little scandalous moment, Miss Bianca and Bernard didn't just rescue Penny, but also the faith of the public where more than ever, people had the confidence in the studio that they could continue their legendary animation legacy without Walt, and that their new animated features still had some of that magic that made them worth watching. However, what they didn't know was that at the company, an inevitable transition began to occur that would change everything. All the old masters that worked with Walt since the beginning were leaving for retirement, and had to pass the torch onto new and young animators that were fresh out of the animation program in the California Institute of the Arts, which one of the founders of the school was Walt Disney himself. Animation remained pretty stable at Disney throughout the 1970s, but that won't mean it would remain that way in the hands of not just the new animators, but also their new leaders. Two Hollywood studio executives have been chosen to run Walt Disney Productions, the first time outsiders have been brought in at the top. The Disney Board of Directors chose Michael Eisner of Paramount Pictures as chairman and Frank Wells of Warner Brothers as chief operating officer. Michael Eisner, and welcome to the Disney Sunday Movie. 